Hello and good day to all our listeners and viewers who watch us from different parts around the world and welcome once again to this amazing section of Cast. Today we have a great speaker and a special guest, General Guy Swan. Lieutenant General Guy Swan currently serves as AUSA Vice President during more than 35 years of active service. He commanded at every level to Army Service Component Command. General Swan, other key assignments included Commander 11 Armored Cavalry Regiment, Assistant Deputy Director for the Strategy and Policy for the Joint Staff, and Deputy Operation for the 1st Armored Division during Operation Desert Storm. So, General Swan, welcome to our channel. It's a pleasure for us to have you here today in INISECCAS. Well, thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you to the Institute for having me as your guest. Uh, it's a real privilege to be with all of you and your visitor, your, your viewers and your listeners. Uh, I am uh, Lieutenant General Retired Guy Swan. I'm Vice President at the Association of the United States Army, uh, better known as AUSA, uh, here in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I've been with the association for 10 years since I retired from my military career, and uh, I continue to support the Army in this position. The association's primary mission is to uh, educate, inform, and connect America's Army with the American people, with allies and partners uh, like yourselves, and with uh, industry partners uh, around the world who help provide uh, equipment and services for our soldiers. Thank you, General Swan. And this is <coughs> the topic for today because we will discuss about General Swan's professional career, his experience as expert and executive corporate advisory board member, and a strategy national security consultant, and his important role in AUSA. So, continue the topic and the many ideas that you have about what is the AUSA's role in US Army as an association and supporting and collaborating with the US Army. Yes, I think it's important for your viewers to understand that uh, the association is a private organization. We are not part of the government. Uh, and that uh, puts us in a, a position where we can actually advocate and speak uh, on behalf of the Army for, for resources uh, that the Army needs to accomplish its mission. So we spend uh, much of our time engaging with members of Congress, uh, members of uh, the Defense Department at the Pentagon, with industry leaders that are providing equipment and services to our soldiers. So it's a very important role that we play. Uh, we do not compete with the Army. Our job is to provide a, a, an outlet for the Army to get its message to a wide audience. And we think that's very important and we have a close working relationship with senior leaders in the United States Army. Exactly. This is the perfect words for that. And um, about that, uh, AUSA is open to everyone or who can join AUSA. And what are some of the key equipment needs to, of the Army in modernization? Yeah, on the first part, uh, membership in the association is open to everyone. We have uh, 250,000 members. They can be pub private citizens, they can be soldiers, they can pe be people from other countries. Uh, and we actually have chapters, smaller chapters that represent us in different communities around the world, 122 of those chapters. We have chapters in Korea, in Japan, all over Europe, in the Middle East, and of course, all over the United States. And we have over 500 corporate members uh, industry partners, large companies and small companies that are also members of AUSA. So it's a very large organization with a lot of reach around the world and uh, especially uh, inside the U.S. Army. And part of the, as the second part of your question about equipment and uh, other tools that our soldiers need, that's a very big part of what we do is to educate people 
uh, on the needs of the Army. Most of the equipment that we have in America's Army is getting very old. It, it's equipment that's been in the, in the force for over 40 years, and it is, it is getting quite old, even though it's been upgraded over the, over the years. So it's time for us to look to new technologies, uh, new capabilities, so we can stay up with potential adversaries that we face around the world. Exactly. We need to have a potential people for that. And what do you think that is the most important, powerful reason for a citizen to give his life for the nation and all the possible uh, candidates for that? Yes, uh, I think in any country, uh, it, it's important to have an army that represents the people. It's an army that defends uh, the sovereignty of a nation. This is important for all of us, not just in the United States, but around the world. And in, in our country, people serve for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they come into the military for education, additional education. Uh, some come in because they have a family and they need to provide for a family. Uh, but everyone serves because they believe in their country and they want to protect their country and their fellow citizens. And that's certainly very true in the United States Army. And in the case, you started in 2012 as Vice President of the Association of the U.S. Army. But what are the main demands of the U.S. Army? Right now, the, the Army plays many roles. Uh, America's Army is, a, is an institution. Uh, yes, it does fight wars when they are needed to be fought. And the U.S. Army has done that throughout its history. Uh, your, for your viewers, you, you may be interested to know that there was a U.S. Army before there was a United States. Uh, the U.S. Army was founded in 1775, and the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain was in 1776. So we had an army even before uh, we, had a, we had a country. Uh, which is uh, very, very important. And so the Army plays many roles. It, it provides war fighting capability, but it's been very, very much involved in the COVID pandemic response. The Army has built hospitals around the United States. It has provide, provided medical personnel to man those hospitals and provide medical care for uh, American citizens, not just for soldiers. Uh, it builds buildings around the world for the United States government. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is a, is a large construction organization and, and is always building. Uh, we've had some internal violence that you've read about in the newspapers over the last few years, and our Army provides security forces to help with local police when there are issues uh, that need uh, law enforcement uh, assistance. We've helped with uh, our border forces. You, you've all heard about uh, migrants coming to the United States through Mexico, mostly from uh, South America. We've had soldiers that have been helping with that as well. And then in the medical community, research and development, uh, the Army is on the leading edge of technology so America's Army is a very, very wide ranging organization. And you mentioned something important about the pandemic, that is this kind of situation affect to everyone, in the, even in the, the country that you are living. How works uh, the US Army during this situation when the pandemic affects all the world? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it obviously the pandemic affects soldiers as well. And uh, we have been working hard in the U.S. Army to make sure our soldiers and their families are safe from uh, COVID, from the pandemic. So we have been uh, vaccinating uh, soldiers and their families so that they are ready to serve 
when they're asked uh, to participate in any particular operation. I think it's also important to point out that the U.S. Army has three parts to it. It has a regular army, a standing army, a full-time army. Uh, that's where I serve. But we also have two other portions. One is the Army National Guard. And then the third one is the Army Reserve. And the soldiers in the National Guard and the Reserve are part-time soldiers. They have civilian jobs, they have families, many are in college or going to school, and they serve when they're called upon to serve. Those soldiers have been very much involved with COVID-19 response in their individual states. So whether it's California or Texas or Florida or New York, all over the country, those soldiers have been helping with local hospitals and local medical professionals uh, to fight the pandemic. Excellent, excellent words for all our audience about this kind of situation that leave everyone. And you served two years at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. as Deputy Assistant Director for the Strategy and Policy. But what can you tell us about how the Pentagon works? Yes, that's, uh, that's, it's an interesting place. It's a very big place. Uh, the Pentagon, of course, is the headquarters for uh, the United States military. Uh, it is uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it's, it's very large. It, it, there are headquarters inside the Pentagon for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, and now a new Space Force uh, in the U.S. military, uh, as well as the Secretary of Defense and all of the staff that works for the Secretary of Defense, uh, for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Uh, for General Milley, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So it's a very large place, but it, it's, it's also uh, an area where a lot of coordination work is done between the, the military and the Congress, the president, uh, and, and all elements of, of the U.S. military. So it, it's, a, it's a large place, but a lot of coordination goes on. The, the, The military operates with commands that are around the world, and those commands actually do the, the missions that they're asked to do. The Pentagon is the organization or, or group of organization that plans, uh, develops strategy, and provides guidance to those uh, forces that are spread across the, the world. Excellent. The words or the way towards the Pentagon is perfect because all are coordinate. It does. It coordinates. That's the primary function uh, of the, the people that work at the Pentagon. It's a very large building. It's one of the largest office buildings uh, in the United States. About 25,000 people work there every day. Uh, a mix of military people and, and civilian people. Uh, employees of the Department of Defense. So it's a, it's a vast organization, but very important for a military that finds itself uh, in over a hundred countries around the world. Perfect, and thank you for that. And um, you know the current situation that we have in Afghanistan. Um, what is your opinion about that U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? Yeah, that was a very difficult decision for, for everyone. And, and I know uh, many of our NATO allies participated in Afghanistan uh, over the last 20 years. And it, uh, it, it caused a lot, the withdrawal was uh, very difficult. Uh, because uh, as many of you saw, it was it was done in a very uh, rapid manner and it, and it was uh, not well handled. Uh, even though the soldiers, uh, Marines, uh, airmen that participated in the withdrawal uh, did a, a very good job. But uh, there's a lot of questions in people's minds about should we have withdrawn? Should we have stayed? I think that debate will continue for some time. 
Uh, clearly, things were different uh, in 2021 than they were in 2001 after 9-11. And uh, so the, the mission in Afghanistan changed over the last 20 years. And I think at some point, uh, Americans and allies in other countries started to wonder what what's the future of this mission and uh, both uh, President Trump and then later President Biden uh, felt that it was time to draw down and uh, and move forward from Afghanistan but I think uh, for your listeners and viewers this this decision will be debated for many many years to come and what do you think that is the future of this mission or the decision that have Biden in this in that case? Yeah, this the the difficult part, uh, Laura, is uh, with the Taliban uh, regaining control in Afghanistan. Will that enable terrorist groups that threaten all of our countries, not just the United States, but European countries and others? Will those, uh, will those organizations, those terrorist groups be allowed to gain strength again as they had been when Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan before 9-11? Uh, before and so this is, this is a, a dangerous period right now while we try to determine uh, what the future is for these organizations in Afghanistan. Also, uh, what does this mean for countries that are also in the region? What does it mean for Iran, for Pakistan, uh, for others that are in that region? This, is, uh, this has changed the entire situation dramatically. Uh, we don't want Afghanistan to become uh, a safe haven for terrorist groups as it once was. And so this is something that uh, Amer all Americans and especially the military and our intelligence uh, organizations are watching very closely. It's totally true. Um, I have uh, some key question for you that I really like to ask you. And uh, you were present at the development of the one of the most important operation, Desert Storm. 30 years after this conflict, what historical lessons should we learn from this war? Yeah, I was uh, part of uh, Operation Desert Storm in 1991. Uh, I was a young major at the time. Uh, I served with uh, the U.S. Army's 1st Armored Division uh, that was part of uh, Operation Desert Storm. And I, uh, my lesson from this, Laura, is that uh, President Bush, when he decided to send forces to uh, the Middle East to uh, uh, get uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces out of Kuwait, because as you all remember, uh, Iraq had invaded Kuwait and, and started that particular conflict. Uh, what we learned from that was and I think Americans uh, understand this very well now, is that we don't go alone. When there is a threat to all of us, we need our allies and partners uh, to be with us, uh, especially our, our NATO allies in Europe. And uh, the reason Desert Storm was so successful was because we had allied support, not just from uh, NATO allies, but also from our allies in the Middle East. Other Arab countries participated in Desert Storm. Uh, many people don't remember that, but there were Egyptian forces and, and others that participated uh, in Desert Storm. And so the lesson for us is uh, the United States, if it has to fight a war or has to respond to a crisis, we should do that uh, along with partners and allies uh, so that we have uh, all the assets and we have world uh, support for those operations. We did have that in Afghanistan uh, for many, many years because of the NATO allies. And uh, the reason we were able to keep terrorists out of Afghanistan is because we had those allies and partners. 
So that was one of the major lessons of Desert Storm. The allies and partners that we have in this world and in this operation was really great because participate a lot of countries in this historical and important operation, Desert Storm. That's right. And uh, as, as everyone remembers, that was a very brief operation. It uh, only lasted uh, a few days. Uh, and even uh, so it, it showed us that when we operate, when we work together, we can be very successful in a short period of time. Excellent words. And I cannot see the best. <laughs> so I have a final question for you that I consider that is really very important for all our audience. What final words can you say to all our audience and viewers about AUSA and why join? Yes, uh, I, would, I would ask everyone to consider joining AUSA, the Association of the U.S. Army. You can do that just by going to AUSA.org ausa.org and uh, there's uh, ample information there on how to join. It's not very expensive. It's very inexpensive to join and there are a lot of benefits uh, to join uh, AUSA. We do webinars much like this webinar uh, for the Army on topics of interest to not only America's Army and America's uh, citizens, but uh, viewers and listeners from around the world, just as you're doing, Laura, to inform people about what America's Army is all about. Uh, we put on a lot of programs, a lot of events throughout the year, uh, conferences, symposiums, and you're able to participate in all of those and your membership helps us uh, put those events on. So I would ask you to consider becoming a member of AUSA. Thank you, General Swan, and excellent words for all our listeners and viewers. So, we have reached the end of this incredible and interesting section of Vinicecast, accompanied by a great speaker and expert with an incredible military background. So, thank you, General Swan, for once again being a part of these interviews and provide all our audience with a complete content about your experience as a military training expert. So thank you, General Swan. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Institute. And I look forward to working with all of you in the coming new year. Thank you. Of course, and see you next time.